Hi, this is Tom from zerodefinals.com. In this video, I want to talk about assessing the jugular venous pressure, or JVP. And this is quite a difficult topic, so my aim here is to really take it slow and explain simply so that you can really follow along each part of the JVP waveform and what you're seeing. So what is the JVP? Well, the JVP is a way to indirectly measure the pressure in the right atrium and in the venous system. So if the pressure in the right atrium is higher, then the JVP will be higher. Higher pressure in the right atrium, and therefore a raised JVP, can be caused by four things mainly. Heart failure, fluid overload, constrictive pericarditis, and cardiac tamponade. So how do we assess the JVP? Well, the jugular venous pressure, or the JVP, is assessed by looking at the right internal jugular vein. And this is a vein in the neck that can be visualised between the medial clavicle and the earlobe, and it runs underneath the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Bear in mind that the external jugular vein can be seen lateral to the internal jugular vein, and we don't use the external jugular for the JVP. We use the right JVP for assessment as this sits most directly above the right atrium, so it gives us the best indication of what's happening in the right atrium. So to visualise the JVP, have the patient sit on their back at an angle of 45 degrees and get them to turn their head slightly to the left. And it's quite useful to shine a light diagonally across the patient's neck so that you can see the change in shadows as you get that JVP pulsation. And what you'll see is a pulsation, a bit like a wave in the neck, with two pulses for each contraction of the heart. So if you feel the patient's pulse and watch their neck, for each beat that you feel with your fingers, you'll see two pulses in the JVP. And really it's more of a flutter underneath the sternocleidomastoid muscle rather than directly being able to visualise the vein. You can distinguish it from the carotid pulse in two ways. Firstly, because it has two pulses for each beat of the heart. So it will have twice the number of pulses as the carotid pulse. And you can also try to feel it with your fingers. And a carotid pulse will have a pulsation that you can palpate, whereas a JVP won't give you a palpable pulsation. So you won't be able to feel anything with your fingers. Another way to check whether what you're seeing is the JVP is to press on the liver or press in the right upper quadrant of the abdomen. And this will cause a temporary rise in a JVP. And this is called the hepatojugular reflex. To measure the height of the JVP, find the angle of the sternum or the sternal angle and measure vertically from this point and then assess where the JVP is and the vertical height from the sternal angle to the level of the JVP is the height of the JVP. So a normal JVP height is less than 3 cm, so a height above 3 cm would be considered a raised JVP. Next let's talk about the JVP waveform, and there's five parts to the JVP waveform. The A wave, the first part of the X descent, the C wave, the second part of the X descent, the V wave, and then the Y descent. And after finishing this video, I think it's worth practicing just drawing and labeling this waveform for yourself and commit it to memory. And that should only take a couple of minutes, but it will really help to consolidate your understanding and make it easier when you start looking at the JVP to work out what's going on. So let's go through each wave and what is happening during them as far as the right atrium. And to do that, I want to use this simplified diagram that shows the internal jugular vein in the neck, which drains into the superior vena cava. And then underneath, you can see the inferior vena cava. Then there's the right atrium, tricuspid valve, the right ventricle, and the pulmonary valve that then leads into the pulmonary arteries that go into the lungs. The A wave happens during atrial contraction. So the right atrium is contracting against blood that's inside it. And this pushes the blood through the tricuspid valve and into the right ventricle. But the increased pressure in the right atrium not only forces the blood downwards, but also upwards 
so the level of the blood in the internal jugular vein rises, and this rise is the A wave. The X descent is caused by relaxation of the atria, and the blood flows into the relaxed atria from the internal jugular vein, and this causes a drop in the JVP. At the start of the X descent, there's also blood flowing from the atria into the ventricle to complete the ventricular filling, and this also leads to a fall in the JVP. Next, we need to talk about the C wave. At the start of systolic contraction, the right ventricle contracts and squeezes blood out into the pulmonary artery, and this pressure pushes up against the closed tricuspid valve and causes it to bulge slightly into the atria. And this pressure into the atria from that bulging tricuspid valve extends into the superior vena cava, into the internal jugular vein, and creates this rise in the JVP that we call the C wave. The remainder of the X descent is caused by the final parts of the right ventricular contraction, where it's squeezed so small that it creates space in the pericardium, or the sac that fills the heart, for the right atrium to fill. So basically, the ventricle becomes very small and creates more space inside that sac so that the atrium has space to fill out. This acts a bit like a vacuum. The ventricle shrinks and creates space inside the pericardium for the atria to fill, so they expand and suck in blood, which causes the JVP to fall. The V wave comes next, and this happens when the atria relaxes and the right atrium starts to fill with blood. At this point, the tricuspid valve is still closed at the end of systolic contraction of the ventricles, and as the atria fills completely, this filling starts to occur higher up into the superior vena cava, the internal jugular vein, and as a result, the JVP rises, and this is the V wave. And then finally, the Y descent occurs when the tricuspid valve opens, and all the blood flows from the right atrium into the right ventricle. And this emptying of the right atria causes the JVP to fall. At this point, the whole cycle restarts and the atria contracts and causes an A wave and so on. So let's go through it all again briefly as a summary. The A wave is caused by atrial contraction, causing the atrial pressure to rise, forcing blood both downwards and upwards into the JVP. The X descent starts with the relaxation of the atria and blood flowing back into the atrium. The C wave is caused by right ventricular contraction, causing the tricuspid to bulge into the right atria. The remaining X descent is caused by right ventricular contraction, causing the right ventricles to take up less room and the atria to expand and fill the space left by the right ventricle and drain blood from the internal jugular vein. The V wave is caused by the right atrium filling up with blood, and in turn the superior vena cava and internal jugular vein filling with blood. And then the Y descent is caused by opening of the tricuspid valve and emptying of the right atrium. Finally, I want to go through some simple abnormalities that you might see with a JVP. A waves will disappear with atrial fibrillation because the right atrium is not contracting in a coordinated way. I remember that the coordinated atrial contraction is what causes the A waves, so this makes a lot of sense. Large A waves can be caused by anything that makes flow from the right atria to the right ventricle more difficult because the atria will be contracting against resistance, and this will cause more blood to flow upwards if it can't flow downwards. Therefore, this would be caused by right ventricular hypertrophy, and this could be caused by pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary stenosis, or it could be caused by tricuspid stenosis, and both of these will cause large A waves. There's only one cause for large V waves, and that's tricuspid regurgitation. So in tricuspid regurgitation, right ventricular contraction will lead to blood flowing back through the tricuspid valve and up into the right atrium, superior vena cava, and internal jugular vein, and this will cause large V waves. This will also cause a loss of the X descent, 
because the ventricular contraction increases the pressure in the right atria rather than relieving it because blood is flowing back through the tricuspid valve into the right atria. So in summary, don't worry if you can't immediately see or work out all the features of the JVP. It's a really complex thing and it comes with time and practice. So for now, just start by committing the waveform of the JVP to memory and remembering that a JVP is usually caused by heart failure or fluid overload. Then just try to see as many patients as you can and get used to examining their JVP. So thanks for watching. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, don't forget there's plenty of other resources on the Zero to Finals website, including loads and loads of notes on various different topics that you might cover in medical school with specially made illustrations. There's also a whole test section where you can find loads of questions to test your knowledge and see where you're up to in preparation for your exams. There's also a blog where I share a lot of my ideas about a career in medicine and tips on how to have success as a doctor. And if you want to help me out on YouTube, you can always leave me a thumbs up, give me a comment or even subscribe to the channel so that you can find out when the next videos are coming out. So I'll see you again soon.